Now, this debate is uh, virtually sold out, 750 tickets sold. I think there were 100 more on the waiting list, which is a tribute both to our subject matter, uh, the passions that the lady arouses still uh, on all sides, and, of course, to the very high quality of our speakers. We have for the motion Lord Bell, Charles Moore, and Sir John Knott, and against the motion Billy Bragg, Sir Peregrine Worsthorne, and Diane Abbott. I'm going to introduce them um, at somewhat greater length individually before they speak, um, but uh, for the moment, let's press on with the debate and hear what they have to say. First of all, we have Charles Moore. Now, Charles has spent a lifetime um, in journalism. Um, he began working for The Spectator, uh, became its editor, and uh, then a weekly columnist for The Daily Express, the deputy editor of The Telegraph, um, becoming eventually the editor of The Sunday Telegraph, a position he held until 1995, when he became editor of The Daily Telegraph. He is currently group consulting editor and columnist of The Daily Telegraph. He's a columnist for The Spectator, and uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, which is the reason he is, the real reason he is here tonight, he is the authorised biographer of Margaret Thatcher. And he was talking just, uh, just before we uh, came in here about the difference between, between being the official biographer and the authorised biographer. The official biographer means that it is government commissioned, which is what he is definitely not doing. The authorised biographer means that he has got unfettered access to all her papers and can write whatever he wishes to write, um, I think he said he's got another five years' work to do on this, um, but he cannot publish the book until um, after Lady Thatcher has passed away, uh, which was something that I didn't know, and I'm sure it would be interesting to all of you. But he's already done a copious amount of work on this book, so uh, to kick off the debate for the motion, suggesting that Maggie Thatcher saved Britain, please welcome Charles Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could I borrow a watch to, so as not to exceed? Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Generous act by Sir Peregrine. Um, thank you. A, a famous Tory who um, wouldn't much have agreed with Margaret Thatcher, didn't, uh, R.A. Butler, famously described uh, the uh, politics as the art of the possible. And that's obviously true, but I think it's also a rather self-limiting idea about politics, because the idea of what's possible constantly narrows in upon itself. And it leads civil servants who know that you believe in the art of the possible to say, sorry, minister, that's not possible. It can't be done. And gradually, um, there's less and less that a minister can do. I want to argue that for Margaret Thatcher, politics was, in a sense, the art of the impossible, or at least the seemingly impossible. And that's why she made such a difference. That's why she did save Britain. Now, to th understand that, you need to go back to the 1970s. Ted Heath went to the country prematurely because of the miners' strike in February 1974, and he asked, who governs Britain? Which was the question on everybody's minds, but a thoroughly stupid question for a government to ask. Um, and uh, uh, the result was, really, that the electric gave, gave no clear answer. And we then had uh, five years of virtually, sometimes, minority Labour government. What had happened, essentially, is that the Tories had confronted union power and had failed. And Labour, under Jim Callaghan in particular, had appeased union power. And after the winter of discontent, had also failed. And I think we must remember in all of this debate that people really did think that Britain had become ungovernable and that economic recovery was impossible. Ted Heath's cabinet secretary, William Armstrong, said that the, the job of the civil service, as he saw it, was the, quote, orderly management of decline. That was the overriding view of what the future held for this country, which really means very little future at all. And I think Margaret Thatcher never, ever believed that. And in studying her early papers and speeches and so on, I find this... Even, even when she's a student, when she's a candidate in Dartford in 1950-51. The idea is always there that Britain has a huge capacity to be strong and free, prosperous and respected. It's an astonishingly optimistic and astonishingly ambitious idea. And I don't know, I happened to be watching the television on the day when the task force set sail for the Falklands, and I remember her sitting there and said, I'm going to quote Queen Victoria, she said, 
the possibility of failure does not exist. Not true, of course, but when you say that, it becomes more true than if you don't. Once we were staying in, um, uh, in a friend's house in the country a few years ago, and Margaret Thatcher was there, and our son, who was seven at the time, suddenly came into the room, and I didn't think he knew who Mrs. Thatcher was, but he embarrassed me because he suddenly he sat down and started to sort of pretend to be a grown-up, and he said, did you like being prime minister? And she said, we had the chance to do important things for our country. So yes, we enjoyed it very much. <laughs> and so, um, so, so William said, oh, did you pass any good laws then? And she said, yes, we did. We made Britain strong in defense, we reduced the power of the trade unions, and we cut taxes so that if people can keep more of what they earn, they earn more. At this point, William's interview went rather awry because he said, oh, did you get very rich then when you were prime minister? <laughs> but but uh, no, we didn't. We were, but, uh, but I thought, first of all, it was very good that she immediately answered the question properly and treated him as if he were Robin Day rather than a young idiot. Um, and secondly, I think that what she said was fundamentally true, those three things. And the hard, factual consequences of that can, to some extent, be quantified. An income tax rate which was 33% standard rate when she began and is 22 now. Inflation which was 17.2% when she began and is 2.6% today. In 1979, day, working days lost to strikes 29 million and 116,000. Today, 236,000. Sorry, 1997, 236,000. And growth. In 1979, Germany's growth rate, 4.5%, Britain's 0.5%. Today, Germany, uh, minus 0.1%, Britain, 2.7%. And UK unemployment today is half the EU average. These are statistical ways of expressing a huge outpouring of possibilities for the British people that have come about as a result of what Margaret Thatcher did. The, setting up, the capacity to set up your own business, the much greater opportunity and in increase in owning your own home, a much greater chance of owning shares, often through privatization, <coughs> having democratic power in your trade union in a way which was actually uh, forbidden by law in the 1970s, and having in general a far greater opportunity to choose your way of life and make of it what you will and a process which I think Tony Blair has to some extent understood and certainly benefited from, in which success builds on success, that the vicious circle from which we suffered in the 70s is reversed and a virtuous circle is created. We got there first, we realized we had to move from manufacturing to services, we encountered and dealt with problems which Germany is encountering and trying to deal with less successfully today. But the other thing about this is what happens in the whole world as a result of this, the huge possibilities for Britain that opened up as a result of what Margaret Thatcher did. The Falklands War was in some respects a total absurdity in that the, um, the place in question was so small, the number of people and so far away, the number of people involved so small. But the principle was not. The principle that aggression had to be defeated. And it did show the whole world, which people did not believe at the time, that democracy can assert political and military will against aggression. And Margaret Thatcher did this, remember, at the beginning, against her greatest ally, America, who were very, very dubious about it, against huge numbers of doubters at home, against a great deal of international opposition. And I do believe, and it was said by Willie Whitelaw on the day we won, that she was the only person who could conceivably have had the will to do that. And once you've asserted your strength, you then create a much greater capacity to do other things than just assert it. And a thing that's not so much noticed about Margaret Thatcher is her capacity to make peace as well as her capacity to make war. Uh, she's thought of rightly as a highly uh, a combative person. But if you look at the history of the Cold War, I think it will show that having made really tough decisions about the sighting of cruise missiles in this country and deliberately going against the conventional wisdom of the Foreign Office and helping dissidents in Eastern Europe, seeing people like Solzhenitsyn, 
that the Iron Lady then felt when she'd achieved something that she could soften. She, f she was the first in Europe who spotted Gorbachev. She was the first to have him to visit. She was the first who told Ronald Reagan that he should see Gorbachev. Gorbachev subsequently became a Soviet leader and Mrs. Thatcher drove a process of tough-minded detente which had happy results. Her period in power began with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and it ended after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. There are huge omissions, of course, and huge problems. I'll leave my opponents to, uh, to deal with all of those, but I just want to end by bringing something else together. I want to think about the impact that one person, and especially one woman, can have. Nobody could dream of arguing that John Major or Jim Callaghan or, or perhaps even Tony Blair, they will see whether Diane wants to argue this tonight, saved Britain. But Margaret Thatcher is different. There is a, a, a way, and it is to do with her sex and her character, in which she embodies, expresses, and magnifies certain characteristics of the nation, and rather as Elizabeth I did in her speech at Tilbury. Early in her premiership, she went to one of those self-congratulatory dinners of a think tank, and she was asked to speak. She was very bored. They'd been speaking for ages. She got up and she said, I've just listened to seven speeches by men. And I'd like to say, the cocks may crow, but the hen lays the eggs. <laughs> Charles, thank you very much indeed. And our next speaker is Sir Peregrine Worston, uh, who was lead writer and foreign, co foreign correspondent for The Times in the early part of his career, just after the war. He was on the editorial staff of The Daily and The Sunday Telegraph uh, for many years and eventually became editor of The Sunday Telegraph. Uh, books he has written include uh, The Socialist Myth and In Defense of Aristocracy. Um, so what is he doing opposing tonight's motion? Let's find out. Sir Peregrine Worsthorn. I asked myself, what am I doing? Because, of course, in many ways, I found myself in complete agreement with everything that Charles Moore has said in defense of, or in praise of, Mrs. Thatcher, because, of course, it was very much the tune that I myself sang with total conviction during the Thatcherite era. And it's a perfectly justified tune. But what I would like to say tonight is something different because we are living in the post Thatcherite era, and it's possible for us now to reflect on those years. I, I, I was a great fan of hers, and indeed a beneficiary. She gave me my knighthood and so on. And therefore, in a way, I feel slightly treacherous <laughs> in, in doing what I'm doing tonight, but I I feel myself that looking at her legacy, which I regard as having been spectacularly and horribly destructive of much that made this country a lovable place, that I have really no honest alternative. Mrs. T was absolutely right to want to reduce the excessive power of the trade unions, but the trouble was that the ugly passion she released to do this went on to destroy much else besides, including, of course, the old Labour Party, but I expect uh, uh, my colleagues on this side will, 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 will dwell on that. But I, as well as, of course, the destruction of the old Labour Party, there was the, to my mind, perhaps more important destruction, the destruction of the old Conservative Party, and she destroyed much else besides. In fact, 
in my view, living here as we do in the 21st century, much else of what made Britain such a lovable place to be. For not content with having trashed, trashed the great tradition of working class solidarity and comradeship, a truly precious national asset, she went on to do the same for the upper class tradition of public service and paternalism, also, in my view, a very precious national asset. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it was a Faustian pact. For the only way she could hope to overwhelm trade union militancy of the period, a militancy which I suspect was at its last gasp, was to release the even uglier passions of Essex man. <laughs> and their ugliness is by no means at its last gasp. <laughs> the only way she could knock the stuffing out of Arthur Scargill was to put it into Rupert Murdoch. Another bad bargain in my judgment. Very much a case of out of the frying pan into the fire. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a horrible period, despite uh, the gloss that, that uh, Charles has put upon it. The language, I recall, tells it all. I remember a close aide of Mrs. Thatcher, one of, one of her loyalist and most supportive aides, saying to me, not only would I die for Mrs. Thatcher, but I would kill for the lady as well. This was profoundly, a profoundly un-English period in British politics. And, and, and the fact that during this period, the phrase do-goodism should have become a dirty word, and that the public-spirited paternalist side of the Tory party should have been dismissed contemptuously as the wets. This was all a, a, a side of Thatcherism that I think doesn't do the lady any credit. Increasingly during this period, I felt that the language of politics was a very un-English one, something that I had never heard in my own experience before. What she wrought was nothing less than a bourgeois revolution. Very little was left un untrashed. The professions, the BBC, the universities, the churches, and even Charles's old newspaper and my old newspaper, the Daily Telegraph. It was on Margaret's watch that this symbol of respectable England, the, the organ that bank managers carried under their arm where they wanted to, be, to, to impress their possible clients and their respectability was the Daily Telegraph. People had it in their house rather like an earlier generation had the Bible to show not just that they were, that they were, that they were respectable people, but they were aspiring to be. It was a symbol of respectable aspiration. And on her watch, characteristically, because the same thing happened to the Times, and, and it, whatever she, her influence held sway, somebody took over with her blessing, and as we now know, after 15 years of proprietorship, has brought the paper into disgrace through having his hand in the till. Yes, it was a bourgeois revolution, and it was probably in its, consequence, in, in its effects as profound as the bourgeois revolution that took place in France 200 years earlier. And just as the bourgeois revolution which took place in France 200 years earlier left the body politic of France sick, sick unto death, and is still never recovered from that. I suspect and I feel deeply that the consequences of the Thatcherite revolution, which we are now experiencing, may have the same effect, not on the economy. God knows, no could be, nobody can ever deny her enormously valuable uh, role in, 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 in improving that, but on the body politic. 
Ladies and gentlemen, with the end of communism, the next great challenge, in my judgment, or in my guesswork, far more seriously, far more serious than the battle against or the challenge of terrorism, is going to be the global consequences of corporate greed. Now, in my view, in my view, Britain was uniquely well qualified to take a leading part in this all-important new challenge. It was, all, it was uniquely suited to do so because of its, the continuities of, of its history. It had, in all classes, traditions, uh, intuitions, sensibilities, which went back to the pre-capitalist age. We, we had this unique record of continuity, and I'm afraid that is a legacy which she has squandered. Of course she meant well. She meant to restore the values of her father, Alderman Roberts. But ladies and gentlemen, it's a very, very sad and tragic story. But it seems to me that what her legacy is, to leave a country fit or fit not so much for her father with his Victorian virtues, but for her son. And this is a very... And this is, and, and this is the burden of my comments. It is that, the consequences of Mrs. Thatcher, which, which is, is the one you should bear in mind. I don't disagree at all with Charles, he was right, but we're now beginning to see the consequences, and it's the consequences I beg of you to consider when you come to vote tonight. Peregrine, thank you very much indeed for that uh, um, interesting and uh, unusual <coughs> angle that you've taken on the motion. Um, we're now going to hear from uh, Lord Bell in favour of the motion. Lord Bell rode shotgun to Maggie Thatcher, um, insofar as anyone could do that, um, during her rise to power and through her years as Prime Minister. He was reputed to offer her advice, ideas on, and lateral thinking on a level uh, which he received from few others. Not surprisingly, he went on to found and become chairman of the Chime Group of Companies, offering, uh, what else, high-quality public relations and business advice to organizations across Britain and around the world and those people who run them, from big corporations to governments. As a trusted lieutenant, he had an unrivaled view of the Thatcher years from the inside, so he is not surprisingly going to speak for the motion. Lord Bell. Good evening. Um, I have a disadvantage in that most of what I was going to say, Charles has already said, but I have one advantage, which is that I went last night to have a drink with Baroness Thatcher. Um, I told her that this debate was taking place, uh, and I can't resist telling you this. She asked me who was on the panel, um, and of Sir Peregrine, she said, Silly Perry. <laughs> um, I did ask her if she would mind recording for me a couple of minutes of how she saved Britain, um, but she refused to um, and said that I'd have to make it up. <laughs> so I'm going to. Um, it, does, it does strike me, actually, that um, having had a drink with her last night, I was reminded of just how feisty she can be. Um, and I should tell you all, for those of you who care, she is in remarkably good nick and not a drunken old fool, as people like to project her in the press. Um, she is very concerned about her son, who incidentally, rather like Conrad Black, has not yet been found guilty of anything. And I think the word alleged would be slipped in there somewhere. Um, Mark is in South Africa and having a difficult time. His mother is somewhat concerned about it, as I think any mother would be about her son in such problems. Um, and that was the essence of our conversation last night. Also, I thought today was rather a striking day to be discussing this, since it's only yesterday that Lord Hanson died. Um, who was one of the great standard bearers of um, Margaret's economic revolution, if I can put it in those terms. He, I don't think, um, qualifies for the Essex um, uh, title that Perry handed on those people who tried to succeed for themselves. Um, but he was somebody who, who benefited hugely from the way that she changed 
um, the attitude that we had towards the economy of Britain. I think to, to understand this debate, which is actually not about what legacy did she leave or is she, did she manage not to solve some of the problems that haven't yet happened, <clears throat> which I think sometimes people are rather prone to discussing, um, the, the real essence of this debate is whether or not she saved Britain. And I think in order to understand that, you have to cast your mind back to the 70s um, and how Britain was when she became Prime Minister in 1979. Um, I think if you consider um, that the Prime Minister had had to go to the International Monetary Fund to borrow money in order to keep Britain going, or if you put it in your own domestic circumstances, having spent all the wealth that you have, you then have to go to the bank to extend an overdraft, and the conditions of the overdraft are somewhat difficult for you, as the IMS rules are, wherever they're handed out. If you consider that the winter of discontent was a time at which people were basically unable to bury their dead relatives, <clears throat> where people were terrorized in the streets from entering factories and entering offices and schools, where the vast majority of the workers, in, of the employed union member workers in Britain, were on strike for no good reason that anybody could understand. When you consider that she um, entered office um, and honored the commitments of the Clegg Commission on Public Sector Pay, which caused her great difficulty in terms of the economic things that she wanted to do, and when you consider, and I, I might, if, I, if I'm allowed to, quote something from her book, which I brought with me in case anybody really upsets me because I shall hit them with it. Um, she looked at, when she um, came to look at the state of the economy, <clears throat> she discussed it in Cabinet as she reports in her book, and it's really where the wets and dries first emerged. Um, the, the issue that people were talking about was what to do about the economy. People knew that there were things that should be done, but they were concerned that they, sh that they couldn't. Um, and she faced this extremely difficult, I'm shuffling my papers around because I've forgotten where I wrote this bit. Um, she, she wanted to change the way that we ran the economy. She wanted to cut taxes. She wanted to reduce public expenditure. She wanted to make uh, industry not dependent on the state, but dependent, but dependent on its successes. It was the view um, at the time that she took office partly caused by the Clegg Commission, partly caused by the IMF loan, and partly caused by um, the difficulties that existed in the economy. It was her view that she should cut taxes. And yet, the problem was that revenue was threatening to decline. How could you cut taxes and see less revenue coming along? It was her view that she should cut public expenditure, but the public sector was the only place creating jobs. The private sector was too weak to do so. Um, and she wanted to reduce industry's dependence on the state by removing state subsidies and making industry stand on its own two feet, which again was something that she passionately believed in. The debate in Cabinet was pretty much along the lines that she couldn't do any of those things because they would have a devastating effect. She said in her book, we were travelling down the down escalator, and in order to escape from it, we had to run up it. And we had to run up it extremely fast. My phone has gone off, it is unbelievable. Probably her. Yes, probably is her. Um, <laughs> no, Billy, I can assure you, she never listened to anything I said, so I doubt if she would ring. Um, she said we were traveling down the down escalator, and it was essential that we ran very fast to get up to the top of it. So she did exactly the opposite of what everybody was saying should be done. She did cut taxes. She did reduce public expenditure. She did remove subsidies from industry. Um, and she did make the private sector stand on its own two feet. She tackled the problem of the, of the imbalance of power that the unions had over the workforce and over the ordinary people of Britain. She would say to me quite often, uh, quoting I'm not quite sure from where, um, I believe in a country where all may grow strong, but none at the expense of each other. That was a very difficult policy for her to, to carry through. Um, she did make Britain a great country again. She made it hold its head up in the face of an environment where I think if you cast your mind back to the 70s, much of the writing that was going on at the time was predicting that we should happily settle in the second or third division, stop trying to be a, a great nation and be important in world affairs, and accept our fate, or in fact, our destiny. The truth is that she accepted none of those things, as Charles so eloquently said. But she began her term of office with this phrase, the forces of error, doubt, and despair were so firmly entrenched in British society, as the winter of discontent had just powerfully illustrated, that overcoming them would not be possible without some measure of discord. 
And it is, of course, the discord that uh, Peregrine touches on as being, he found, rather offensive and vulgar. But she recognised that we were not going to shake ourselves out of the situation that we were in unless we allowed ourselves to have some discord, for people to disagree with each other, for the wets to be different to the dries, for the people who thought that their job was to protect those people um, who were poor and who were weak, would sometimes misunderstand some of the things that she did, although I can assure you from my own personal experience, she only ever wanted to help those people. She also recognised politically that we were entering a new era. I think it was J.K. Galbraith <clears throat> who, when asked to define the middle classes, said that the middle classes were functionaries without capital, who can nuke like stand against the ear-rising tide of proletarianisation. And that was a force that she could recognise was coming. But I think, in my view, history will reflect that Margaret Thatcher saved Britain when it was at a crossroads. A crossroads of giving Britain a sense of identity or allowing us to backslide into geopolitical oblivion. A crossroads of empowering British people by being tough on the unions and reducing dependence on welfare or continuing the debilitating dependency on a state unable to respond financially. A crossroads of economics which would reduce taxes and create jobs or one which would undoubtedly continue the nation's financial decline. And finally, perhaps most importantly, a crossroads which meant standing shoulder to shoulder with America to defeat once and for all the awful political and economic system that was communism in the Soviet Union, or to sneak out the back door on our responsibilities to our country and the rest of the world. I think that she did all those things, and I think that she left Britain in a much better condition that when she took it, I think she saved the country from the kind of disasters that were being accepted by people as the norm. She left us a freer country, a prouder country, and a more successful country. She did, in my view, save Britain. She also had a hand in saving the world. I will leave you with one last story, which I, a, a story, a note I got when she left office. <clears throat> it was a handwritten note from John Burt who was then the Director General of the BBC and who is now Lord Burt and in the Downing Street Modernisation Unit and one of Tony Blair's most trusted advisers. He was the Director General of the BBC, which I should remind you, Dennis would frequently describe as a nest of pinkos. Um, in fact, I remember uh, John Burt also threw a dinner for her um, when she left office and we went along to this, to this dinner and I went with them and Peter Jay was amongst the hosts and Dennis walked up to him and said, I'm amazed at what you do, you know, Peter. Wonderful the things you achieve. What kind of staff do you have? And he said, um, just one researcher. He said, we well, write all that stuff with just one researcher. And Peter Jay said, no, no, I think you're confusing me, Sir Dennis. You're thinking of when I was the economics editor of the Times. <clears throat> I'm now the economics editor of the BBC. And Dennis replied, never watch it. <laughs> um, John wrote in this rather sweet note to me um, the following sentence. The sad thing about her departure is that all those people who wish to make something of themselves will now have to try that much harder. I urge you to support the motion. Lord Bell, thank you very much. And uh, we now come to um, the great Billy Bragg, recently described by the Times newspaper as a national treasure. In the two decades of his career, he has made an indelible mark on the conscience of British music, becoming perhaps the most stalwart guardian of the radical dissenting tradition that goes back over centuries of this country's history. He is here tonight as an anti-Thatcher crusader, a very well-known one, after seeing how the Conservative government of Margaret Thatcher was changing the fabric of British society and as he saw it decimating the mining communities, his songs became more overtly political. He became a fixture at political rallies and benefits, particularly during the 1984 miners' strike uh, with his strident songs of political solidarity. And those songs have taken his albums many times into the UK top 20. His songs speak of freedom and the need for social change. He is known to some of his fans as the Bard of Barking. Um, we shall see whether he lives up to that title tonight. Billy, over to you. Billy Bragg. Thank you very much. Um, I have to tell you that uh, Barking, of which I am a Bard, is, uh, is a town in Essex, Perry. Um, and uh, 
I, I, I do resemble that remark uh, uh, about Essex Man. I think we were, uh, we were much maligned uh, in the 1980s. Um, but uh, I do find myself uh, a rather strange uh, uh, situation for me to be uh, on the platform here with, uh, with Sir Peregrine. Uh, but I find myself listening to the things he said uh, and, and, and understanding uh, precisely where, where he's coming from. The question I think about Margaret Thatcher, did she save Britain, uh, is exactly the, the, the way that, that Perry framed it. She was, some would say, the, the, the greatest post-war conservative prime minister. But what did she actually conserve? Let's think about the things that, um, that she attacked. Our institutions, local government, the Greater London Council. She got rid of Ken Livingston. Yeah, right. In the end, what Ken Livingston stood for democratically appealed to Londoners. Mrs. Thatcher couldn't abolish that. It's impossible to do that. At the other end of the spectrum, she took our fragile constitution, which has developed over a thousand years of history, and she bent it out of shape in order uh, to, uh, to express her will to do what she wanted to do. And what did that do? It left our constitution open to those of us who want to reform it because people saw how fragile and how transparent it actually was. Do you think the House of Lords would be on the agenda of abolition of the hereditaries would have happened were it not Margaret Thatcher using them time and time again, getting the backwoodsmen in uh, to put through her, her uh, policies? And also in, in, in Scotland and Wales, uh, the, the, the matter of the union, the integrity of the United Kingdom was brought asunder by Margaret Thatcher when she decided that the Scots who wouldn't vote for her, they were them, they were not us. So she cast them out, the Scottish Nationalist Party were able to, to find a, a revival of nationalist spirit and the end result was a Scottish Parliament, a Welsh Parliament, possibly one day even an English Parliament. If, if this does happen, I feel that the, the first little tear uh, that began to, uh, to break the United Kingdom apart will have been done by Margaret Thatcher. The monarchy. What did she do to the monarchy? Well, she let Rupert Murdoch buy the Sun. She made uh, the, uh, the, the, the Sun newspaper, the Times newspaper group so powerful. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, as you well know, is a Republican. Uh, he's had absolutely no compunction in going after the royal family. Left them in a situation now where they're on a par with Pop Idol. Um, what about our armed forces? The importance of our armed forces. Listening to previous speakers, you would think actually that, uh, that it was Margaret Thatcher who ended the Cold War rather than Mikhail Gorbachev. Can I remind you that it was Yuri Andropov who put Gorbachev into the Politburo, not Margaret Thatcher. And uh, it was Mikhail Gorbachev himself at, uh, at meeting with, uh, with uh, Helmut Kohl in 1990 who agreed to the reunification of Germany and Germany's inclusion in NATO. These were things that the Soviet Union did for itself. And strangely enough, I'd see it's ironic, I suppose, that Gorbachev had that one thing in common with Margaret Thatcher, that uh, he was, in the end, done down by his own colleagues. He wasn't able to complete uh, his revolution. But don't let people rewrite history and tell you that the West won the Cold War, democracy won the Cold War, the people of the Soviet Union. How fortunate we are. Think of all those years during the Cold War when we feared that it would end in nuclear holocaust, but it actually end, ended in the people of Eastern Europe rising up and liberating themselves. Isn't that a great achievement for Europe? I think that's one of the, one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. Our sovereignty, the sovereignty of our nation. Which prime minister plugged us more into Europe than Margaret Thatcher? She signed the single European act. You should listen to what the UKIP say under their breath about Margaret Thatcher on their weird little websites. It's amazing what you can find out when you put these words into a search engine. Uh, Margaret Thatcher signed the Single European Act uh, and her, her uh, how and heard all of them uh, pro-European cabinet members took Britain further and further, closer and closer towards uh, a European super state. And uh, most crucially though, the damage I think that she did was to our way of life and to the family. By destroying the trade unions, by breaking the power of the trade unions, she left ordinary working people with no one to uh, protect themselves 
from the creeping Americanization of our workplace and our culture. It's true that there were uh, high tax rates, the top rate of tax in 1983 when she came to power was 83%. It's now 40%. But up until 1979, inequality in Britain had been diminishing since 1948, since the setting up of the welfare state. Since 1989, inequality has been widening again in this country. It's true that she did find the country in decline, but that was because we were dealing literally uh, uh, both psychologically and economically with the decline of our empire. That period of time was over, and those problems were exasperated and, uh, and, and just made much, much worse by the, uh, the decision in 1973 of the OPEC nations uh, to begin to punish the West through hiking of oil prices. Yes, the Labour government did go and lend money from the IMF, but when Margaret Thatcher came to power, the things that she did to the British economy were far beyond anything the IMF had, been, had demanded. And even Milton Friedman, the architect of monetarism, at one point criticised her for creating unnecessary unemployment. She cut taxes, that's true, and she cut red, red tape in order to fire inflation, the great monster of the late 60s and the 1970s. But despite this, inflation grew and unemployment went to record levels. And the fractures that she caused in our society have not yet healed. She was an ideologue. She once told the observer that uh, her way of constructing a government was to have in it only people who want to go in the direction that the Prime Minister wants to go. To me, she said, consensus seems to be a process of abandoning beliefs, principles, values and policies. She later commented uh, that people who believed in consensus were quislings and traitors. She realised, I think, that the only way that she could open Britain to the corporate greed that's already been referred to by previous speakers to make us competitive was to smash the post-war consensus that had built up of the experience of the British people during the Second World War. As far as I'm concerned, the great sacrifice of the British people in the Second World War was re rewarded by the setting up in 1948 of the welfare state and the consensus that built around that between all political parties, that it was clearly a good idea to have a society in which there was collective provision of health care, of education, and decent, affordable housing. All of these things were dreadfully undermined by Margaret Thatcher. My point is, she was not a conservative in the classic sense, in the one nation sense, in the sense that Charles Moore and the sense that Peregrine Worsthorne here uh, believe in. She was something else. She was an entrist. Just as the Labour Party uh, was, was entered by uh, socialist Marxist revolutionaries in the 1970s, so the Conservative Party in the mid-1970s was entered by a capitalist uh, uh, entrist group led by Margaret Thatcher and putting forward the ideas of monetarism. We might now call them neoconservatives in the present language, where they believe in, in very few things, certainly not facts. Um, they, uh, they believe in, in greed, and they believe in force, and they believe in their own, uh, the righteousness of their own cause. Margaret Thatcher embodied these principles while George Bush was still chugging beers and, uh, and driving around drunk and doing all those other things he did uh, before he found the person whose name we don't want to mention in politics because those, uh, those things don't go together. My, my point is that, that Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher left us as her legacy a spiteful country, a nasty country, a country which f had forgotten really what it was about. In the end, the rights of the individual are very, very important, but they can only be assured by the collective provision of certain things, health care, education, decent, affordable housing. Sure, she sold off all the council houses, but where are your kids going to live? How are they going to afford a house? And she did let everybody own shares, so now everybody has shares and no pension. In the end, it's not either individualism or collectivism. It's a mixture of the two. Margaret Thatcher, in her own way, in her own terrible way, was a radical. I ask you to vote against this motion. Thank you.
Billy, thanks very much indeed for that. Uh, our final speaker for the motion is Sir John Knott, uh, a prominent Conservative MP during the 70s and 80s. He most notably served as Secretary of State for Defence in Mrs Thatcher's government during the Falklands War and before that as President of the Board of Trade. His autobiography, Here Today, Gone Tomorrow, takes its title from a famous moment uh, almost 20 years ago, and uh, I'll tell you what it is because I see quite a few young faces in the audience here who probably won't remember that incident. Um, during a live primetime interview on BBC television, Sir Robin Day, the great inquisitor, uh, called him, and I quote, a here today, gone tomorrow politician. In response, he called the interview ridiculous, pulled off his lapel microphone, and walked off the set and out of the studio. Um, he clearly is not doing that tonight, for which we are immensely grateful. <laughs> Sir John Knott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had about 800 letters um, after I walked out of my interview with Robin Day, and only three uh, disapproved, and they all came from the BBC. <laughs> um, but um, I want to start by saying that um, Billy, who spoke before me, is unquestionably a national treasure, and he shares that distinction with Margaret Thatcher. It, it's, it's, it's um, absolutely true that Margaret Thatcher was not a conservative in the traditional meaning of that word, uh, unlike Billy. He's old Labour conservative. Margaret was a radical. And the times, if some people here will remember them, required a radical. And that's what they got. And I looked to see how many people voted for Margaret Thatcher in 1979. It was 13.7 million. And in 83, it was exactly the same number, 13 million voted for Margaret Thatcher. And after eight years, the number of people who voted for her at the British general election had risen. So, if all the things that are said about her, and some of them are not really very nice or fair, are true, why did the British people go on voting for her? And why all these votes, where did they come from? Of course, they came mainly from traditional Labour voters. Now, Billy, um, I have a great admiration for him, and I took the great advantage of buying his biography. It, it <laughs> It, 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 yes, no, it's not. It's been remaindered. And, 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 um, it, 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 it did, in fact, cost me a pound. Um, and Perry, Perry's book, by the way, is two pounds off. Um, I'm afraid if you buy my book, which I'm sure you all will, you'll have to pay the full price. Uh, now, Billy, I want to say he did a great job during those Thatcher years at community sing-songs all around the country. <laughs> they all gathered round and sang the red flag. It must have been a really fun evening. Uh, but the, 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 the one that I liked most of, all, most of all was he did the saving school dinners thing and he sang a thing called Don't Let Spam Fritters Become a Thing of the Past. Now, I like that very much because spam fritters are an authentic socialist dish. Nigella Lawson, please note. Now, why did all those natural Labour supporters vote for the Tories in, 59, in 79 and 83? It was because a gang of trade union leaders had grabbed political power. They were sapping the power of the government to govern and of business to succeed. I remember Moss Evans, Ray Buckton, Jack Jones, Scanlon, Mick McGarhy um, getting indigestion by continually eating sandwiches at number 10. Um, bodies were lying unburied in the mortuaries, rubbish was piling up in the streets, food and fuel supplies were disrupted, schools were closed for want of heating, and in 1978, I think uh, Charles mentioned this, 25 million working days have been lost with strikes. 
Some people might say it was a real socialist paradise. Great Britain was the sick man of Europe, and everybody laughed at us. The whole post-war establishment, senior politicians and civil servants in this country, were presiding over what I think uh, Charles described as the politics of decline. The sick man of Europe, uh, the established British establishment thought, should be allowed to decline peacefully in a gentlemanly fashion in the sort of way that Perry would approve of uh, without confrontation. The workers, the CBI, and even Perry's aristocrats, in defense of aristocracy, his book, they were all combined together to make sure that nothing was ruffled, that this country declined peacefully. Now, the fact is that Margaret was a radical, and aristocratic paternalism had actually failed. Harold Macmillan uh, was a great paternalist, and one can understand that someone who fought in the First World War in the trenches with the soldiers, uh, who had these Whiggish connections as a result of his marriage, who'd actually had a constituency in the north of England in pre-war days, one can understand why he felt as he did. But he did preside, Harold Macmillan, over the National Committee for the Peaceful Acceptance of National Decline. And a group of Tory radicals, led by Margaret Thatcher, decided things had to change. Now, Ted Heath, actually, and I was in his government, made a valiant attempt to do a deal with the wreckers. So we had something called tripartism, a, a sort of cozy deal between the government, the unions, and the CBI. And Ted did try. He had an appalling horror of unemployment. And it led, actually, tripartism, the deal that he tried to bring, to chaos. And so what happened was the Tory party was disrupted. Julian Critchley called it the Peasants' Revolt. The backbenchers of the Tories' party rose up in rebellion and they booted out Ted Heath and replaced uh, him with Margaret Thatcher, a rather strident lady. And in Perry's words in his book, he says, we were replacing an existing lot of tolerant and genial rulers because established and secure, I agree with that, with a lot of almost certainly insecure and rough-edged rulers because new and unestablished. That's chaps like us, new and unestablished. We were arrivists um, and second-hand car dealers from Essex. We were called garagists, garagists. <laughs> People were advised to write to Margaret Thatcher care of Dickens and Jones. Now, many people here, I don't know if Dickens and Jones still exists. I think it almost certainly does not. So, it's, it's a straight quote from your book, Perry. Sorry. Well, never mind. <laughs> I will find it for you afterwards. Now, I can understand some people's hostility towards something called Thatcherism. Do you know, I never heard a conservative refer to Thatcherism. It was a word invented by the left as a term of abuse. But Margaret Thatcher certainly believed in self-interest. But self-interest is different from selfishness. And selfishness is different from greed. No politics can succeed in a democracy if it is not based on self-interest for individuals and for families. The task is to channel self-interest into promoting the public good. So I conclude by saying that Margaret Thatcher's greatest achievement, in my view, was to arrest and reverse the politics of decline. It needed her as a courageous and tough leader with a group of other people around her to boot the British establishment out of its lethargy. And yes, institutions had to be confronted. Yes, the country had to be jerked out of the complacency that had lasted far too long since the Second World War. The political power of the trades unions was destroyed. Not the trades unions, the trades unions weren't destroyed. Their political power was destroyed. The sale of council houses gave ordinary families a sense of personal independence and ownership. Privatization destroyed the cozy and utterly unenterprising culture of the public sector. 
it was painful, very painful, but the old declining industries had to be closed down. If you were to tell a young audience today that before privatization of British Telecom, that's not very long ago, it took you six months to get a telephone, and then it only came in black, they wouldn't believe you. That's what privatization did. Of course, it is true that the collapse of the steel, coal, shipbuilding, and other state industries was unbearably painful, and the high price of the pound exacerbated unemployment. But the country had to be forced into the real world. There was never going to be any gain without pain. And the final act, actually, which opened this country to the real world was the abolition of exchange controls. I remember I was a treasury minister, and one of my jobs was to police exchange control. And a lot of PC plods, retired policemen, used to come into my office, and a great gang of people from the Bank of England, and they used to show me a brochure of holiday villas, which were owned in Spain and elsewhere, and uh, they said that these people have bought their villas overseas without going through what was known as the premium dollar. You had to pay a big premium in order to buy anything abroad. It was the kind of closed world so beloved of totalitarian states. It was a nanny state. Now, no one laughs at the sick man of Europe anymore. We have higher growth and lower unemployment than any of our European partners. Uh, I have a chart at home which shows the wealth of France and the wealth of England over the last 200 years. And it's only actually during the last few years that this country has become richer than France. And in fact, we are now the fourth richest country in the world. Now, economics is a dismal science. And I don't by any means suggest that prosperity is more important than social cohesion and happiness. But my goodness, prosperity counts. And history shows that when a country uh, travels towards economic collapse and anarchy, which is exactly the position we were in in 79, that is the thing that brings around a totalitarian state. So I conclude by saying that in my view, Maggie Thatcher did save Britain. And I don't see really how anyone can deny that fact. Thank you. Sir John, thank you. Uh, our final speaker opposing the motion is Diane Abbott, uh, who is one of that rare breed these days, an independent-minded and feisty member of parliament. Um, she made history by becoming the first black woman ever elected to the British Parliament and has since built a distinguished career as a parliamentarian, broadcaster and commentator. She served on a number of parliamentary committees. She's been on the Treasury Select Committee, uh, the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, and most recently um, she, um, she has set up a special parliamentary committee investigating gun crime. She appears regularly on television and radio. Uh, who would miss her regular appearances on Andrew Neil's late night political discussion program on BBC One, where she jousts with Michael Portillo. Um, but when I say that she set up a special parliamentary committee investigating gun crime, I am convinced that she has come here tonight armed only with words with which to oppose the motion. Diane Abbott, ladies and gentlemen. It is with um, some trepidation that I come to the rostrum this evening following an array of clever, distinguished, and mostly titled gentlemen to put forward the proposition in front of the serried ranks of Middle England that the Thatcher era was not, in fact, a golden age. And I am mindful of the immensity of my task after all, some of you are too young to remember the 70s, and so we'll believe all that guff from Tim Bell about dead bodies piled in the streets and all the rest. Some of you may have done well under Thatcherism, and some of you even might secretly believe, like my friend Sir Peregrine, 
that the only problem with Mrs. Thatcher was that she was really a little bit too bourgeois. But nonetheless, despite the immensity of my task, I have arguments to put before you. Even though I'm well aware that if you're talking about Mrs. Thatcher saving Britain, in many ways, I'm exactly the sort of person she was supposed to have saved Britain from. <laughs> Let me begin by making one point. You've heard speaker after speaker, mostly titled, come to the rostrum and trash the post-1945 welfare state. They would have you believe that from the 1945 general election and the election of the Attlee government to 1979, nothing good happened, Britain was a basket case. It was one long litany of decline. And as more than one of them has said, piles of dead bodies lay in the streets. Let me tell you something about the post-1945 welfare state, because it's fashionable, even, I have to say, among some of my colleagues in New Labour to trash it. And let me tell you, I am a product of the 1945 welfare state. I was born in 1953. And only under that dispensation could the child of Jamaican immigrants who themselves left school at 14 come here and have, I say it without, with modesty really, one of the best educations money could buy all the way through to Newnham College, Cambridge, and a master's degree in history for free, and leave that university believing that I was as good as the Lord Knotts, the Sir Tim Bells, and the Sir Charles Moore. Free orange juice, free education, and a sense of equality. Those were some of the themes of the post-1945 welfare state. And you've heard a lot about politics tonight from Westminster insiders. But let me tell you, for ordinary British people, when they look back on that period from 1945 to 1970, many of the things that are most intrinsically British, many of the things we are proudest of, many of the things which mark our British identity, whether we originate from Jamaica, Pakistan, or right here in Britain, many of those things flourished and characterised the post-1945 area. It suits the Thatcherites to say nothing good happened. It suits the Thatcherites to, to create this Kafkaesque nightmare, nightmare picture. But it wasn't the reality for my generation. I entered Parliament in 1987, and Mrs. Thatcher was then in all her pomp and pride. And let me agree with some of the speakers that have spoken before me and say she was a truly remarkable person. There's no question about it. I unlike anyone else on this um, platform, sat opposite her in Parliament, on the opposing benches, for years and years. And perhaps the most extraordinary thing about Mrs. Thatcher was there was this um, lady in her 40s, I think she must have been, when I first crossed her path, surrounded by an almost entirely male Conservative Party, much more male than it is today, and she would sit there on her front bench, her ankles, much admired by people like Sir Tim Bell and Lord Norton, Sir Charles Bell. <laughs> her, her ankles very neatly crossed, and each and every one of those august knights of the shires and Tory MPs in suits were scared shitless of her. <laughs> and that, that, that was truly remarkable, and it was worth being an MP in the 1980s to go into the house and contemplate that spectacle day after day after day, because you knew. Many of them despised her because she was, after all, a grocer's daughter. You knew many of them didn't know how they ended up with a woman as leader in the first place, and yet she ruled them entirely through fear. And you will have seen um, in the speeches we've heard this evening that Mrs. Thatcher to this day excites a strange mix of idolatry and fear in a certain sort of Englishman. Um, not being English by background and not being a man, I daren't speculate as to what it is. Memories of a bare bottom being spanked by nanny, I won't go down that path. But what I'm asking you to do for the remaining minutes of, of my remarks is to strip away the mystique 
to strip away the glamorization of Mrs. Thatcher by the Lord Knotts and the Sir Tim Bells and the Sir Charles Moores. And to look at, oh sorry, not Sir Charles Moore, but it suits him, doesn't it? <laughs> to strip away all of that idolatry and strip away the way they rewrote history, rewrote, trashed everything that happened for 30 years until she came to power. And to look at the social consequences of Thatcherism. Because if you look at Thatcherism and society, if you look at Thatcherism and domestic policy, her leading idea, her big idea, the idea which, for better or worse, New Labour continues to implement, was the elevation of the market. For Mrs. Thatcher, the market always knew best. For Mrs. Thatcher, there was no form of social provision, be it education, be it health, be it care for the elderly, which would not be improved by the introduction of market forces. And yes, that did represent a break with what is described as the Butskalite consensus, the consensus which ruled from 45 to 1970. She did attempt to take the market and market forces where market forces hadn't been before. And we are living with Mrs. Thatcher's elevation of the market, Mrs. Thatcher's big idea, Mrs. Thatcher's deification of market forces to this day. Last night, my government, my own government, put forward legislation to deregulate casinos, as if the people in Hackney are short of places to gamble, as if, as if the introduction of huge US casino monopolies onto British soil represents any sort of gain for the society as a whole. But that is where Thatcherite deification of the market takes you. And when people say, that Mrs. Thatcher saved Britain. When the Lord Knotts and the Sir Tim Bells and Sir Charles Moore say that she saved Britain, they mean she saved their Britain. I put it to you that there's a wider Britain outside the Westminster village and a wider reality who are perhaps not so quick to believe that she saved them. Did she save the elderly? It was Mrs. Thatcher that broke the link between pensions and earnings. And what we've had ever since her era is the relative decline of the state pension until now we have one of the lowest pensions in Europe. Of course, because she adored the market so much. She also told the elderly or people approaching uh, old age, or oh, you can put your money into private pensions, which of course collapsed. Did she save young people? She brought the market into education. She began the move to take away grants. Did she save the poor? When Mrs. Thatcher left office, we were in a more divided society than ever, a bigger gap between rich and poor than ever. But finally, let me say this. Mrs. Thatcher left us free, proud and successful. Free if you're an old person struggling to live on a declining pension. What are we proud of the hundreds and hundreds of homeless people you can see in the centre of London any evening this week? Successful if you judge success, as Charles Moore does, by your rate of tax. Maybe she was a success, but I believe, and I'm in politics because I believe, that there are many other important things to building a good society. I believe that Mrs. Thatcher may have saved Britain for the people represented on this top table, but I believe we are living with the damaging consequences of a deification of the market to this day. I beg you to oppose the motion. Anne, thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, just before we allow you, the audience, to enter the fray, I can tell you how you voted when you came in today. 347 of you were for the motion, and 142 of you were against. Uh, 157 of you did not know, so 157 minds to be, to be made up. And I have to say that if all those minds were made up, to join those against the motion, um, the motion would still be carried unless some of the 347 who came in here voting for it 
have decided that they will change their minds in the view of what they have heard tonight. And that's what makes what happens in the next few minutes particularly exciting. Um, so, who would like to kick off? The one proviso I would make, by the way, is that uh, uh, please keep your comments relatively short so that as many people as possible can have a say. You can either ask a question or you can make a comment. If you want to direct it to a member of the panel, please do so. I won't call in every member of the panel on every question, and we will try and rock and roll through this um, as quickly as we can, editing as we go, as it were. And I see a question from, I think it's the lady down there at the back with her hand up, if you could get a microphone to her. And uh, if you'd like to just tell us, give us your name and uh, maybe who you represent so the evidence can be taken down and used against you. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? My name is Victoria Preston, and I'm a lifelong Labour voter, but I'm very, very uh, disillusioned with Diane Abbott's government. Do you think, Diane, that Martin Lewis was right when he said that uh, Margaret Thatcher saved Britain because she made Tony Blair possible, or that she didn't save Britain because she made Tony Blair possible? Diane, that was, that was intended as a, as a little joke at the beginning, but someone's <laughs> taken it. <laughs> Someone's taken it very seriously. Uh, how, would, how would you interpret it? Did, did uh, Margaret Thatcher make Tony Blair possible? Um, there are many um, remarkable things about Tony Blair. Um, <laughs> but when I, did, it, I did ask you to keep your answer short. <laughs> but when it comes to domestic policy, I would argue, and this is a problem some of us in the Labour Party have with him, that he is actually Mrs Thatcher's natural son and heir. And much of what he's done is to bed down many of the turns to the market which she took in the 80s. So, so, so Mrs Thatcher did change Britain? Well, as far as Tony Blair's concerned, I mean, apparently he went to her for advice in the early years of his premiership. And you see what happened? <laughs> right, next, uh, next question, please. Yes, gentleman down here. Yes, if you could stand up, uh, everybody, that would be great. Uh, Am I the right one? Yep. Um, Sir Chairman, uh, John Maddox, ex-editor of Nature. Uh, I, would, I voted on the way in to oppose this motion, and nothing I've heard this, this evening has changed my mind. And the reason for it is quite specific, quite specific to Mrs. Thatcher. If you look at the proportion of British GDP, gross domestic product, spent on research in Britain, you find that it... <coughs> It was quite high in the 1940s, just under 2%. It fell steadily from 1984 to 1997. It's now going back up again, thanks to the Labour government's policies. Mrs. Thatcher was responsible for this. It happened on her watch, as Donald Rumsfeld would say. And later, late in my spell at nature, I went to see her, trading on the fact that she and I had been trained in chemistry in the same lab at the same time, although I must say she was much busier running for chairman of the Oxford University Conservative Party than for uh, chemistry. Nevertheless, I went to see her and asked her why British spending on research had declined, and she had the gall to say the following. These international comparisons don't matter because, after all, as you know, British scientists are smarter. And that struck me at the time to be an ignorant remark. I did my best to suggest so. But also one that was deeply damaging to Britain. So, thank you. John? Sir so John, do you want to comment on me? Sir so John, would you? Well, I, I, it's such a complicated subject. I mean, I would like to know how you define research. Um, are you talking about uh, public sector funded research or private sector research or are you talking about original research or applied research or I mean you know it, it's a huge subject so I couldn't really respond without knowing what you're referring to well well in fact let, let, let's I, I, I think that is a subject for another debate actually I think we won't we won't pursue that at the moment uh, if you don't mind but thank you very much for making that point um, yes um, gentleman just down there yep. thank you and anyone, uh, is there anyone up in the guards? Thank you. Um, if you'd like to join the queue for the microphone up there, if you want to speak, just make your way around to the microphone and I'll see you're up there and come to you. And I'll come to you. Uh, could we get a microphone to this lady here and we'll come to her 
um, after, after we've taken that lady up. Uh, sorry, the gentleman up there. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Curzon Price, entrepreneur. I'd like to ask the panel, and particularly the uh, four, uh, about, to remind them and ask them about Tina. And I think Tina was the time, sorry, Tina was at the time the reason a lot of us thought that uh, supported Thatcher. There is no alternative. And I think that the panel has implied, for the panel, the four panel has implied there was no alternative. But with 25 years of hindsight, it seems to me that one can no longer say there was no, no alternative. You can look at continental Europe and you can see economies that are just as healthy, healthy as ours and you can see polities which are much healthier than ours. There was an alternative. And I'm glad to see that uh, John Nod. Uh, uh, fell to one of the temptations which I think all Thatcher files have to fall to, which is to cling to, onto any statistic which shows that continental Europe is doing less well than we are. Thatcher files have been trying to do this for 20 years, and statistic after statistics shows that they do not. They're doing just as well, and they did not destroy their polities. Okay, uh, Lord Was Bell. there an alternative? Lord Bell. Um, I don't actually remember who... Sorry, let him. I don't actually remember who invented Tina. Um, I've heard it said about Blair. I've heard it said about many things. Um, and I've actually heard this government talk a great deal about how much better Britain performs than the rest of Europe. So I don't think that is exclusively the, the territory of people you call Thatcherophiles. Um, nor do I think your argument's very compelling. We didn't set out, the Thatcher government didn't set out to try and beat Europe. The Thatcher government set out to try and change the direction that this country was heading in. This country was going down the tubes, um, and she did the things that were necessary to stop it going down the tubes and make it believe in itself again and enable it to be a success. That's what the debate is about. You don't like her. That's entirely your affair. A lot of people don't. Um, the gentleman before you doesn't like her attitude towards research. Um, nobody suggested that people liked her. One of the things she didn't court was, was popularity, um, which is one of the things I admired about her. Billy? So there's no alternative then? Is that what you're saying, Tim? Basically. I mean, this idea, this idea that we weren't in some way com competing with Europe, I think it was you who used the phrase of sick man in Europe when you spoke. I mean, it is true. I mean, and it's always Germany that we're compared to presently, that we're so much better off than Germans. That's because they've had to take an industrially uh, wrecked country into their economy over the last uh, 10, 15 years. It's going to take them a long time before they, they survive that. We're still having to get over what was done during the 18 years of Thatcherism. It's going to take us a long time to put our polity back together as well. OK. Um, Charles, Charles Moore, do you want to come in on that point, the Germany's troubles at the moment, or maybe specifically due, as Billy suggests, to the, to the reunification? Uh, well, they clearly, they clearly um, are added to by reunification, but I think they are more profound. Um, I think there was no alternative because uh, our situation in economic and industrial relation terms was so much worse when Mrs. Thatcher became prime minister than was the case in Germany uh, or France. And uh, what you're seeing now is a need to confront comparable problems, not so severe, but comparable in Germany and France and other continental countries, which they have very poor um, political means of dealing with. Because they, for very understandable historical reasons, are very, very frightened of, of the conflict that is involved in dealing with these questions. But unfortunately, conflict is sometimes involved in dealing with these questions. And this was the key uh, Thatcher insight. Um, when people talk about her fracturing society unnecessarily, I do think it's very, very important to remember that it was fractured. It, it was broken, and somebody had to fix it. Jim Callaghan, when he was prime minister in his last year, was in, virtually in tears, I think actually he was in tears, about the behavior of the trade union movement that he loved. He thought the sheer selfishness, that word has been used a lot, the sheer greed that was exhibited by union leaders was beyond his comprehension. He didn't know what to do about it. His attempt to uh, work with them had failed and something different had to come and it did. So, so Peregrine, how do you react to, to Charles' point that, that there's an element of conflict involved in, in achieving any kind of effective change? Well, I could, I, I'm afraid I can't I couldn't hear, so I don't feel I'm really very, that, that, very qualified. That, 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 was, that was the point, one of the points he was making, that in fact uh, you have to have a degree of conflict 
which Mrs Thatcher was, was rather good at, in order, to, in order to achieve effective change? Well, I think that's a truism that, that nobody could deny, but I think there's an equal truism. That you have to have a measure of consensus if you're going to hold a society together. I think we can swap truisms until the, until the cows come home without getting very much further in the argument. OK, Diana. Well, I'm, I was just... You say that Lord Knox made a very telling, and if I might say so, a very Thatcherite point, that you have no gain without pain. Just a matter of interest, I'm Lord Bella. I'm so sorry. No, 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 Lord Knox. It was Lord Knox who made that point. I'm Mr. Knox. John. <laughs> Sir John. Sir John. And we don't know who's a Catholic. Lord, Sir, what does it matter? Their titles. Doesn't matter. No. Doesn't matter. Um, Doesn't he, made, he made an important point. A, a, very, a very kind of Thatcherite point when he said that there's no gain without pain. The problem for some of us about the Thatcherite years is that Thatcherites made all the gain and the rest of us had to endure all the pain. Right, yeah. Um, I, 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 it, there was an alternative, of course there was. There was an alternative, and that was to proceed um, in the way that the Macmillan and indeed the Heath government had attempted to bring about consensus but everybody who lived through that period realizes that at the end of the Heath government, consensus had broken down and failed. So there was an alternative, but it just didn't work. Could you, could you say that there was no alternative to Mrs. Thatcher's uh, determination to, to reduce the power of the trade unions? That was what uh, she will be remembered for doing. But she didn't rest there, did she? She went to, to, to do the same thing to the professions. She tried to do the churches. She tried to do it to the universities. Nobody really questions that the, was a, that the trade unions were causing a, a great deal of economic disastrous trouble. But surely uh, we can agree there. But then the really interesting question is the second stage, the, the, the march through the professions and through the institutions. That is the thing which endangered, uh, and still endangers, the health of this society. And that is the central, it seems to me, indictment, not about the, the trade unions, really, but about the forces she unleashed in beating the trade unions, which swept through the rest of society with grave damage, which we are suffering from to this day. That is what I would beg of you to remember. Not that we, nobody can argue about that she had to take on Mr. Scargill, but what happened afterwards that we should consider? Right, can I take a quick series of points from the floor? Um, this lady uh, here who has the microphone, and after that, the gentleman by the pillar, by the pillar there who's uh, raising his hand, and then, and then, uh, and then we'll, take, uh, we'll take two from up above. Thank you. Uh, yes, okay. this lady um, first. Charlotte Leslie, Kensington Chelsea Conservatives. If Margaret Thatcher did or didn't save Britain, what exactly, apart from Diane, um, did or didn't she save Britain from? And can I ask the panel what their ideas of success at that juncture in time would have been and whether various forms of success would be mutually exclusive? Hmm. Um, I, uh... Yep, okay, Tim. Um, what she saved, saved us from was the um, products of decline, um, which I think we've all tried to explain in our own ways, back to Diane's irritation, um, which actually wasn't an attack on every government since 1945. It was a comment. Sorry, beg your pardon, I'll start again. What she saved us from was the politics of decline um, and the acceptance that Britain should become a second division country, wallowing in a rather genteel, um, desperate situation. Um, Definitions of success. I think that winning the Cold War was successful. Whether Diane thinks we won it or not, I think we did. Billy Rowell, I think we did win it. Um, I think uh, getting Britain to a point where it is competitive in the in the world is important. Um, I think that the British people feeling uh, keen on themselves is important. I think those are examples of success. Um, and uh, as I said at the very beginning. The alternative that hung around at the time that she came to office was to continue down the path of decline or stop that decline and run back up the down escalator as fast as we could go. And that's what she did. Right, let me, let me take a question from uh, up, in, up in the guards. Uh, yes. Richard Hart, I'm a conservative. Um, 
question leads you, on I'm, really... I'm, I'm slightly alarmed by the fact you've got a full scap page in front of you. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh, it's, I wonder, um, it's got your details on could, it, Martin. Could, I'm could you, reading could those. A couple of quick sentences, and then, because what I want to do now yes. is try to just hoover up some, some thoughts and opinions and questions which our panellists can then incorporate in their remarks at the end. Do the, do the panellists consider that we could have achieved the economic prosperity we have done um, from the Thatcher era with a little less of the breakdown in social cohesion? Do they think that could have been possible if things had been done differently? Right, thank you. Let's, 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 let's park that for the moment. Uh, yes, um, the gentleman up at the back by the pillar. And then, could you get a microphone to this gentleman just down here? If you'd raise your hand. Yeah, and we'll do that next, yeah. Um, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Dennis. I'm a lifelong conservative. Um, uh, Diane Abbott, like most of us in the hall, I hope, um, like most of us in the country one day, I hope, um, Diane Abbott made great clay of this word deification, as though Mrs. Thatcher was in the habit of burning incense before an image called Marquitia or something in the depths of Downing Street. I would put it to Diane Abbott that she and her political confrere, certainly before the fall of the Soviet Union, certainly before the um, discrediting of socialist tyranny throughout the world, made um, a god of the state. And the only thing that can provide pensions other than the market is the state, and very unpleasant, poor little pensions they usually are too. If you look at France, it's facing a terrible deficit precisely because it tries to provide pensions uh, on, the, on those lines. And if you look back at England, Mrs. Thatcher had successfully transferred pensions to the private sector until the wreckers, Gordon Brown, decided to take five billion from the pension funds every year and push the stock market down. So again, it is socialism's failure. It was capitalism's success. I trust it will be capitalism's <coughs> success once again. Mike, thank you. Um, let me take, yes, this gentleman here. My name is Neville Conrad. Mr. Chairman, I've attended um, uh, these debates right from the outset, and I think I've missed one. And I'm bound to say that without any doubt, the contribution that I heard from Mr. Peregrine was one of the finest contributions I've heard in any debate here on any, any subject. And I would ask... I would ask members of the, of the, of the um, audience, when considering voting, to think very carefully about what he said. Of course Margaret Thatcher um, put an oxygen mask um, on business and on enterprise. Um, of course she got the dustbins off the street. But what else did she do? She created mini-capitalists by the very interesting wheeze of bringing home ownership into everybody's reach. But she also created a society that unless you owned, then you weren't counted. Now, did Margaret Thatcher save Britain? What is Britain? It's a state. It's a society. Now, what one must ask oneself when deciding whether she saved Britain did she really save society, or is society in the state it's in today because of her? Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to end by, by coincidence, I came across a piece by Matthew Paris, in which I couldn't believe uh, reading that uh, he quoted Margaret Thatcher saying, a man who, beyond the age of 26, who finds himself on a bus, can count himself a failure. And I put that to you, and if you really believe she said that, you cannot vote for the motion. Yes, can I take the lady, the lady up, uh, up oh sorry, gentlemen, sorry, big your pardon, sorry. The half. <laughs> <laughs> um, Craig Rimmer, uh, conservative as well. I, uh, <laughs> I, actually, are there any Labour supporters in here? Can I just <laughs> check? Yeah, yeah, there are, there are, yes, okay. <laughs> Okay, very quickly, because I do want to take some, some, some points of view from the other side of the argument. If we could get microphones to that gentleman there with the, with the fuzzy hair, if that's the <laughs> right way to describe you. Yeah. I, I, just, I just want to touch on the language issue about discordant language. Obviously, Margaret Thatcher started off with a speech outside number 10 uh, uh, by St, you know, creating St. Francis of Assisi and, and talking about uh, bringing a chord and and all of that, and channel of my piece, and all that sort of stuff. But with, I mean, Sir, Sir Peregrine was talking about language, and it being discordant, and Margaret Thatcher was almost waging a war with language. But who actually felt they were being attacked by the language? If there's 13 million voters, as, as we hear, who were constantly coming out voting for Margaret Thatcher. She employed 
language that FDR even used in the United States of creating mysterious enemies in, in many ways to attack, to actually unite the nation behind her and the party and the government to go on and fight the real enemies in terms of the bankruptcy of this country at that time. She, she did what was needed in that respect. And I noticed, I noticed even Diane is into this sort of discordant language, uh, creating um, the uh, mysterious enemies. When she talks about Lord Bell, Sir Charles Moore, who's been given an honorary knighthood by Diane, and <laughs> Sir John Knott, this was her attempt at discordant language. Thank you. Okay, fine, thank you. And uh, the, um, where's the, 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 there was someone down there with, uh, actually, can I take, uh, yes, sorry, there we are. Yes, the, the person there with the, with the splendid you. fuzzy hair. Thank so. you, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I am a Labour Party member and a supporter. And actually, to a certain degree, I have um, Margaret Thatcher to thank because of her disastrous policy, I joined the Labour Party and um, actually become a, a, a very stout parliamentarian as well. So um, I remember the time during Thatcherite years when homes, although she sold them off, um, actually she didn't invest in rebuilds. Um, so a lot of people became homeless and there was a huge waiting list for council properties really tar targeting the poor and the disadvantaged in our community. So, in a sense, perhaps she did save Britain, but who did she save it for? Certainly not for the disadvantaged and those people who represented the working classes. I remember the bankrupt businesses and the huge numbers that did go into bankruptcy and into liquidation. I remember those homeowners who've had their homes for years and who were repossessed. And I suspect the panel four are actually probably um, like a pregnant woman who forgets the pain during labor and promptly goes and has another baby afterwards. So um, perhaps the panel for the four should really readdress its policies and its perspective. Certainly Thatcher was right for you because you gained under Thatcherism, but not for the majority of the working classes and certainly not for the majority of the British people. Thank, thank, thank you. Um, can I take the gentleman just down there in the blue, in the, I think it's a light blue shirt, the gentleman there, and then I'll take one more person from upstairs. Yeah. Um, Alex, <clears throat> Alex Darwell. Um, I just want to tell Diane that her bitterness shines through and thank the Lord that we've got market forces to keep people like you at bay. And <laughs> is there any chance, is there any chance, is there any chance of Sir John not returning to the front bench of the Tories party? Because we need, we need people with common sense, and he has a good understanding of economics. You would do well to spend some time learning some basic economics from men like him. Yes, and uh, the lady um, just up there. Alice Sherwood, uh, not a member of any political party. Um, I gather... That's, uh, good heavens, that's amazing. How did you get in? Uh, <laughs> uh, through the back door. Um, I gather that over the period of time in question, um, the poor have got poorer and the rich have got richer. If that is the case, would the panel tell us um, in what sense Maggie Thatcher could have been said to have saved the poor of Britain? There may be a sense. Um, so what has Maggie Thatcher done to save that section that got poorer? That, that, that is a very good thought to... Uh to leave with our panel. Um, in fact, we have now come to the, to the, if you like, the final five, six minutes, because I'm conscious of the fact that we do want to try to end as we promise everyone at 8.30, although I guess we could have gone on all evening. I'm going to ask each of our panelists in reverse order for a one minute summing up. And while they are doing that, would you like to cast your votes with your tickets, which you've got? I, now, if you want to vote for or against, tear them in half and drop the appropriate the appropriate word into the box. If you want to abstain, just drop in the ticket untorn into the box. And we're going to do that now, uh, as is our tradition, while the panelists, while the panelists are summing up. And, um, and then we will give you the result of that when they have finished their summing up. I know it's slightly unconventional, but it's something that we do do here, and it keeps interest bubbling right through until the end. So, so can I... Uh, First of all, ask our panelists strictly one quick minute each while all of you are voting. Um, Diane, would you, like to, would you like to start and give us a quick, quick minute? Uh, Summing up. My, my argument was simply this. Whether or not you believe 
that Mrs. Thatcher say Britain depends on your perspective, depend on whether you gained from that area, era or whether you were disbenefited. And I would put it to the audience, even at this late stage, that there is a wider Britain outside this hall who, who are living with the social consequences of the Thatcher area. And for them, she didn't actually save anything that they held dear. Sir John. <clears throat> well, I, I spend my whole time on a bus, and uh, I don't know. Um, I was never frightened of Margaret Thatcher, and um, if anyone had been in the cabinet meetings that I was in, uh, they would have been astonished at the heat and argument that was created. I've never understood this um, statement that um, she ruled by fear. She loved argument, she loved dispute, and it puzzles me. Anyhow, I, as I say, I, I, I always travel on a bus because Mr. Livingston has given me a bus pass. <laughs> and I don't really see why the um, council taxpayers in Hackney uh, should be paying for my travel. So perhaps the market um, would be better able to redistribute wealth and resources rather than Mr. Livingston. And um, finally, I would just say that I remember going to um, Gatwick uh, years ago, before <coughs> Margaret Thatcher came into power. I can tell you, you didn't see huge millions and millions of people taking their Ryanair or EasyJet flights to Spain. I mean, the prosperity of the country has been transformed. Uh, no one is suggesting that prosperity is everything. And there may be a lack of social cohesion at the moment, and we must try and recapture it. But Margaret Thatcher didn't destroy the health service. She tried to improve it. She didn't destroy it. She didn't destroy the trade unions. She's tried to take away their political power. She didn't destroy education. She actually tried to improve it. I'm not sure she was always successful in those objectives, but um, the notion that she was uh, hard-nosed and, un and, and unthinking about social cohesion and social things is just simply untrue in my view. Billy Bragg. Thank you. Yes, well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm greatly encouraged uh, by the turnout tonight that this is still a matter of some, uh, some dispute. I get a, a little warm glow in, in my heart every time when I'm watching Question Time and her name gets mentioned and the audience hiss. Um, it, it, it cheers me up greatly. One of the reasons why um, we don't want the Labour government to legislate for the building of mega casinos is because we are concerned about people when they gamble. We think they're wasting their money and it's going to impoverish them. What Margaret Thatcher did in order to make those 13 million people vote for them was she allowed them to gamble. She allowed them to gamble because what she used to reverse the decline in this country, as the guy was asking up there, was she used market forces. And in unleashing market forces, market forces, those 13 million people took a gamble that they might benefit from it. My sense is the majority of them did not. One of the great things uh, that, that she achieved, I think, is to put the Conservative Party in a position where someone as ordinary, straightforward, straight-talking as Michael Portillo can't even find a seat. That's Margaret Thatcher's legacy. She did that to Conservatives. We have that to thank her for. In the end, the point is, in the end, I think Margaret Thatcher, one of the key things, perhaps Charles, you might want to think about this for your tone, is the thing that's significant about Margaret Thatcher was she was the last Prime Minister to be born before the welfare state uh, came in, to be born not in the 1940s, as subsequent Prime Ministers and leaders have been, but to be born in 1925. She had a sensibility that was pre-welfare state. She saw it as something that was undermining those values, and her <coughs> entire career was devoted uh, to, to trying to bring that down. Because in the end, whether she likes it or not, there is such a thing as society. And if you take out the institutions that support society, then the whole damn thing is going to crumble around your ears. Okay. Lord Bell. Well, I think that's quite interesting, actually. I, I think what, in order to make your mind up how you're going to vote, you need to think about this. It's quite obvious that Billy and uh, Diane think that the market is the cause of all disaster and misery and unhappiness. And they identify Margaret as being the market, which, of course, she isn't. Um, she was indeed keen on the market. Um, and what, what you've got is three different views expressed to you here. Those of us who believe in small citizens, in large citizens and small states, who believe in individual responsibility, who believe that allowing people to grow and succeed is a good thing. 
those people who believe that people should be dependent on the state, that the state knows how people should live their lives and how they should spend their money and will dictate them how to do it. And then you've got the rather grand view that Perry has, which is whichever way you choose it, please do it rather eloquently. Um, and I mean, the, the reality is that the attitude of the, attitude of the state controlling people's lives started in, in, uh, in a big way post the war in Atlas government. It predominated throughout that period, and it got us to the economic decline that we were in um, in 1979. Um, you may not, any of, all of you, remember what that was like. The truth is that we had gone to the bank manager because we were broke, and we had to borrow some money in order to get by. There was no way of paying the money back if we continued to create less wealth and if we continued to simply invest money in failing services. Um, what Margaret did was save Britain from itself and absolutely save Britain from the kind of economic and social thinking that Diane Abbott has and that Billy represents. She didn't save it from the kind of attitude that uh, the Peregrine has to, towards these things. She was actually rather fond of aristocrats, and clearly, as Diane finds it so deeply offensive, she managed to create a few of us um, so that we could, we could continue to be equally grand. Um, it might just amuse her to know that I got a knighthood from Margaret Thatcher and a peerage from Tony Blair, so I must be really, really evil. <laughs> Sir Peregrine. I think the, the point perhaps none of us have mentioned is there used to be a time when the brisk and the brightest in this country wanted to go into public life to make history. And now I think the best and the brightest much prefer to go into business and make money. Now, I entirely agree that you've got to get the balance right, the balance between those who want to serve their <coughs> country and those who want to feather their own nest, because feathering their own nest cumulatively feathers, feathers is economically desirable for all of us. But I think we have now a serious problem which, to some extent, I blame Mrs. Thatcher for creating, and that is that public life is no longer attracting anybody. Nobody worthwhile wants to go into politics. Nobody want, worthwhile wants to go into public life at any level. And if this, is the, if this is true, this is a terrible, terrible indictment of those who are responsible for bringing this deplorable state of affairs about. Do not believe the speakers who point to the statistics of economic growth and say that is the test of saving Britain. If you have trashed the institutions, parliament is no longer respected, the civil service is no longer respected, all those who run our institutions are suspected of being in it on the make. This is a, a, a the nation will not benefit from a public life that has been reduced to this low esteem. And I think that it, 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 it is a serious matter to ponder if Mrs. Thatcher did have this consequence. All the stuff we have heard, how well the country is doing, how this is something which has to be regarded, in my view, as a short-term gain at a long-term calamity. And if our public life has gone rotten, that is a calamity from which you and your children will all, in the end, suffer. Charles Moore, a final word. I think what uh, Sir Peregrine and Dame Diane and um, uh, 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 the... Uh, um, and what um, Martin didn't quite call the barking bard um, uh, are... Um, are uh, missing something very, very important. Um, there's a novelist not so much read as he should be called, William Cooper, uh, and he, in one of his novels, has a distinction. He says, Labour stands for envy and hope, and the Tories stand for nostalgia and fear, and on the whole, he or the character in the book prefers uh, envy and hope. But actually, I think what Mrs. Thatcher did is scoop the pool, possibly with all four of them, uh, though conceivably not with envy. 
She had nostalgia and fear under her belt, but what the other side are missing is, is that she offered hope. She offered a possibility, as Labour did in 1945, which is why working people voted so overwhelmingly Labour in 1945. The upper working class in Britain in 1979 and in 83 and in 87 voted for hope. They voted for her because they thought it would give more opportunity, more freedom, more dignity. And I think they were right. And that is a very important, you have to remember who, it's constantly raised, who gains. And I think it's not true to say that the people who were all right anyway gained. It is a whole new set of people, the rising, striving class in society who gained. And that must always be a healthy thing for society. Now, before I, before I open this magic piece of paper to show how your votes have changed, if at all, um, I would like to, uh, I'm also conscious of the fact that you were going off to look at the result of the US election. So um, I would uh, just like to remind you of a story about a senator who ran for the presidency about 40 years ago. And he stood in 21 <coughs> primaries and came bottom of the poll in every single one. And at the end of the 21st primary, he called his campaign staff together and he said, he said, I'd like to thank you for supporting me through these primaries, he said, but I've decided to quit the race for the presidency. The people have spoken. The bastards. <laughs> and not only is there one American presidential candidate who's going to be feeling that, or maybe, maybe he should be saying the lawyers have spoken, the bastards, you know, if it gets very close. Uh, but not only that, but I, I feel that uh, uh, someone, um, three people, uh, are possibly going to be feeling the same way about you, um, although, seriously, I suspect not. I think this was, uh, has been a very excellent and charitable debate carried out in extremely good spirit with some quite exceptional arguments uh, put forward and put forward most cogently and well. So, how have you voted? Right, at the beginning, 347 of you were for the motion. At the end, 393 of you were uh, for the motion. Against was 142, that is now 209. The no don't knows have been reduced by 48, uh, 248 from 157. So 100 people who came in, 100 or so people who came in here undecided um, have actually voted um, one way or the other. And, uh, I can tell you then that, uh, that the ayes have it. You have uh, voted by 393 votes to 209 that Maggie Thatcher did save Britain. So thanks to all of you for your contributions and to our family.